Okay, thanks everyone for joining and um, welcome to the Landmark Chambers webinar um, Telecoms Resisting a Code Agreement and Terms of Agreement following the decision in CTIL and University of the Arts London. And we're delighted to see so many of you joining the session today and we hope that you find the discussion useful and informative. Just to begin with a few housekeeping points. And firstly, your microphone's automatically muted so you won't need to or be able to adjust that. We are welcoming questions throughout the session, so please put those in the Q&A um, function and we'll either address them throughout the discussion or at the end. We'll try and answer as many questions as possible. This webinar is being recorded, so you will receive a link to the presentation after the event concludes. Uh, if you lose connection at any point during the webinar, then we invite you to rejoin just by clicking the original link again. Um, so the title of this talk is Resisting a Code Agreement and Terms of Agreements um, following the UAL decision. There's two key issues in telecoms litigation that a client will often ask about. Firstly, when is it possible to resist the imposition of a code agreement? Um, and secondly, if I can't resist it, what will the terms of that agreement be? Um, what can I insist upon and what can I um, refuse? Uh, these two issues were the focus of the important judgment um, in the decision in Cornerstone Telecommunications Infrastructure Limited, known as Cornerstone or CTIL, and the University of the Arts London, which we're referring to as the UAL case, which was a decision decided back in September 2020. It's that, it's that decision which is the main focus of the webinar today. We have a distinguished panel to talk to you about that case and also some of the other important decisions in this area. Um, which came through at the end of 2020. At two in particular, the CTIL and London Quadrant Housing decision from October 2020, and the more recent On Tower UK um, JH and FW Green Limited decision, um, also referred to as the Dale Park decision, um, which came out at the end of December and was on Lawtel yesterday. The UAL case is significant really for two reasons. Firstly, it's a rare example of the tribunal actually grappling with um, the merits of whether a code agreement should be imposed at all. And secondly, it contains a detailed, uh, albeit obiter, consideration of the terms which the tribunal may impose at the request of an operator. Both of our speakers today are landmark telecom specialists, Toby Watkin and Jonathan Wills. Between them, they featured in many of the cases on the new code. Uh, in particular, John acted on behalf of the successful site provider in the UAL case, and so he'll give us the benefit of his insights about the implications of that case. First of all, for those who haven't uh, recently read the UAL decision, um, Toby's going to run through the facts of that case and remind us of the relevant key statutory provision. So handing over to you, Toby. Thanks, Miriam. I hope you can all hear me. I get a yellow box around me now, so I assume that you can. Uh, the University of Arts uh, is a collegiate university in London. Um, and this dispute related to its e Elephant and Castle campus for, perhaps ironically, the London College of Communications. Uh, CTIL is an infrastructure provider. It's the joint provider for Vodafone and Telefonica. And all three of those, CTIL, Vodafone and Telefonica, are code operators. Until uh, July 2020, CTIL had a communication site on the Elephant and Castle shopping centre. However, uh, Elephant and Castle is being uh, fully redeveloped and the first phase of that involved the demolition of what they would call the east site uh, which included the building on which Cornerstone's mast stood. Uh, so CTIL's plan was to move that mast onto the building of the UAL and then when the east site was rebuilt move back again. Uh, the UAL building itself was on the west site uh, and was also scheduled for demolition later on. Uh, UAL had entered into an agreement with a developer uh, which would build it a new site on the east site, so it was going to move sites as well, and on practical completion of its new building, uh, UAL would sell its old building to the developer. Uh, the structure of the deal uh, gave UAL effectively 18 months to leave uh, once the sale had occurred, and then it imposed very large penalties indeed. It did it by way of a sale and leaseback, so uh, after the sale UAL became uh, a lessee paying nil rent for the first 18 months and after that the rent rose to three million pounds a year, um, UAL could break that lease by giving vacant possession of the property. So that was the mechanism by which it could move out and kill its uh, lease. 
Um, but if it didn't uh, give vacant possession, the lease wouldn't end. And also it was subject to a damages, a potential damages claim. Uh, so UAL was um, perhaps rightly concerned that it might not be able to give vacant possession because CTIL uh, would be on its roof. And once a code operator is on your roof, it could be somewhat difficult to get rid of them. Um, so CTIL therefore, uh, because it, uh, UAL was unwilling to grant an agreement, it applied to the tribunal to impose one. A couple of uh, key aspects of the code for those of you who aren't as familiar with it uh, as others, um, which are important to bear in mind as the context of the dispute. The first one is if you um, have a coding agreement opposed upon you as a site provider, the process of removal of a code operator is very convoluted. It requires you to give 18 months notice to bring the agreement to an end, even if its term has expired, and you can't do it until the term has expired. And then the operator can resist that by serving a counter notice and issuing an application to the tribunal. So there's a long process to terminate the agreement. Uh, then the tribunal has to consider whether or not the site provider can make out any of the grounds for termination. And if it does, then the agreement comes to an end. Then there's a further process for actually forcing or requiring the operator to leave if the operator doesn't leave. So getting an operator off your roof in a hurry may be difficult, particularly if the operator has a strategic reason why it's difficult, it doesn't really want to move because, for example, its future location has been delayed. The second thing to uh, note in order to understand the UAL decision is that there's a power also to grant interim code rights, um, which can be expressed simply to last for a particular period and then they die or uh, to last until a particular event. Um, because you don't need to terminate those, um, an operator with interim rights will have much less scope for um, not leaving uh, if uh, it decides actually it doesn't want to leave at the end of that process. So it gives the uh, site provider a much more stable relationship with the operator in terms of the site provider's future needs. Uh, CTIL did in fact apply for interim rights in this case as well, but only to last up until the tribunal made a final decision in relation to the imposition of a, what we call a final code agreement, a permanent code agreement for a defined length of time, but which would then roll on under the protective provisions of the, uh, of the code. At one point which the UAL made in this litigation was that CTL actually only needed a temporary um, set of rights uh, because it only temporarily wants to be on their building. So that was an issue flying around in the case. So turning then to the tests that the tribunal was in, uh, applying in, in the agreement, those of you familiar with the code will be very familiar with these provisions, but I'll quickly run through them then. If we could have the first slide up, please. Uh, when being asked to impose a code agreement, the tribunal has to apply the test set out in paragraph 21 of the code, which consists of two conditions and a proviso. Uh, the first condition is in subparagraph two. Uh, so I'll just read that one out. The first condition is that the prejudice caused to the relevant person by the order is capable of being adequately compensated by money. And the second condition is that the public benefit likely to result from the making of the order outweighs the prejudice to the relevant person, i.e. the person on whom the agreement is in this context being imposed. Now you have to bear in mind in relation to that uh, second condition, the public benefit um, outweighing the prejudice, as it was pointed out by the tribunal in the case called E and Islington number two, that the prejudice um, when you're thinking about prejudice, you have to bear in mind that compensation is payable um, in relation to these agreements, not um, market value consideration, but compensation for injury. So the prejudice is the prejudice bearing in mind that you are compensating for it. The proviso is in paragraph subparagraph five, and that is that the court may not make an order under paragraph 20, that is imposing for these contexts, imposing an agreement, if it thinks that the relevant person intends to redevelop all or part of the land to which the code's rights would relate or any neighboring land and couldn't reasonably do so if the order were made. So the site provider's intention to redevelop the land trumps the ability to um, get a code agreement imposed upon him because if that proviso is made out, then the tribunal has no power to impose an agreement. One recent, as it were, interesting crumb which has come out of the cases, in this case it's a case called On Tower, uh, also known as Dale Park. Every case in telecommunications has two names, one of the party names and also the site name, so uh, watch out for that. Uh, in the middle of that case, at a paragraph 49, um, 
Judge Cook points out that the word may is used in paragraph 21. The court may make an order under paragraph 20, effectively imposing an agreement. Um, and in uh, paragraph 49, she says in terms that that's a discretionary power, therefore. So there's a discretion on the tribunal. That's sort of consistent with something that Deputy President said in the Islington case I just mentioned in relation to interim rights, where the word may is also used. And the Deputy President said interim rights are a discretionary power. However, no uh, court yet has actually had to grapple whether that, whether that is a uh, discretionary power. And all of the decisions to date that I've seen proceed on the basis that if the proviso is not satisfied and if the two conditions are, then the agreement will be imposed. So if there is a discretion there, nobody's yet sure uh, what uh, the discretionary criteria might be. I myself doubt whether there is in fact a discretion there, uh, but that's a matter which needs to be subsequently uh, debated, I think. So if the uh, tribunal decides it is going to grant an agreement which imposes code rights, uh, the tribunal then has a discretion as in relation to the terms it imposes, and that arises by virtue of paragraph 23. So if we could have the next slide, please. 23, 1 and 2 uh, effectively say that the uh, tribunal may impose an agreement which gives effect to the code rights sought by the operator. So the rights themselves are distinguished in this context from the terms of the agreement, uh, the rights being a confined list. Um, with such modifications as the tribunal thinks appropriate and must include such terms uh, as it thinks are appropriate. Um, so then paragraph 23.3 um, requires the tribunal to include terms as to payment of consideration by the operator, although as those who follow this area of the law will know uh, that's a nominal consideration or at least next use consideration. Uh, and then paragraph 24, um, uh, a subparagraph 23.4, refers to paragraph 24, which deals with the provisions. And then paragraph 23.5, uh, the tribunal must include uh, terms which the tribunal thinks are appropriate for ensuring that the least possible loss and damage is caused by the exercise of the code right to occupants of the land, uh, owners or those for the time being on the land. Uh, in addition to this, which is the major provision which governs the question of what terms the tribunal will um, impose, uh, there are also other provisions in paragraph 23, 7 and 8, which deal with um, duration. Uh, it has to specify duration. And 8, it has to consider um, break clauses and lift and shift provisions in all cases. The other important provision which deals with terms and which John is going to look at more closely is paragraph 17. That imposes a particular requirement in relation to upgrading and sharing. There are minimum thresholds in relation to that. And John will be talking about that a bit more later on. So the decision itself then, uh, Judge Elizabeth Cook concluded um, the following things. Firstly, uh, in relation to this argument about whether or not interim rights were appropriate, she said uh, that the jurisdiction of the tribunal is such that it can grant interim rights for as long as it needs to do. Uh, there's no theoretical jurisdictional limit in relation to that. Um, so that clarified an important point, which isn't really the central focus of what we're talking about. As to whether to grant new code rights by imposing an agreement, the court found that neither of the two paragraph 21 conditions were satisfied, so it couldn't be compensated um, by um, a money payment, and uh, the prejudice to the site provider wasn't outweighed by the public benefit. Uh, and therefore, it concluded that it didn't have power to impose a code agreement at all. So that was effectively the end of the case. Nevertheless, uh, as Biram has already touched upon, uh, she then went on to consider the detail of the terms of the agreement, which the parties were actually asking for or contending for, and touched upon a number of points there also, which are of potential importance. So she went through the list of the points and dealt with the various important factors which uh, govern the question of those terms. But that's a quick summary of what happened in the case and the provisions that she was applying. Thanks, Miriam. OK, so thinking about that, the first half of the decision and the paragraph 21 test, when will a code agreement be imposed by the tribunal and when will it not? If I could just turn to John. John, it seems like there was a sort of background of redevelopment, um, but did the redevelopment proviso apply? And if not, why not? 
Uh, no, it didn't. Um, of course, it's a, it's a useful provision for a landowner who is seeking to resist the um, imposition of a code agreement, because if it's found that the redevelopment proviso, proviso 21.5 is met, then that's a complete block to the application and the code agreement simply won't be imposed. Uh, however, uh, in this case, um, it didn't apply uh, for, for reasons that the uh, ground F uh, redevelopment uh, ground in the 1954 Act context sometimes doesn't apply, namely that um, the person in occupation wasn't the person who was intending to carry out the redevelopment. So in the UAL case, it was the third party developer that was intending to carry out the development and not the respondent to the claim, not the current occupier of the land, the University of the Arts. So the university wasn't uh, able to rely on 21.5 to resist the application. Uh, uh, however, um, the two conditions within Para 21 that were relevant and that did need to be considered by the tribunal were, were 21.2 and 21.3, um, namely the two conditions that um, had been mentioned. Firstly, uh, it was held that the injury could not be compensated in money. And secondly, that the public benefit uh, of the um, imposition of the order sought did not outweigh the prejudice uh, that would be caused to the university. Okay, so just on that on that first condition, what was the um, injury that the judge held couldn't be compensated in money? So this is dealt with at, at fifty six and fifty seven of the judgment, and uh, there are a number of a number of sort of intangible uh, elements that the court or the tribunal held uh, were sufficient to allow the respondent to succeed on this question. Um, so firstly, uh, it was to do with the risk, the risk of litigation uh, at the point at which the university would be seeking to um, recover possession of the land from the operator. Uh, th th that litigation in order to achieve that vacant possession was uncertain uh, and um, it would cause, it was said in the judgment, it would cause stress and uncertainty uh, to the respondent's employees. So I think we know there that that uh, one can take into account, at least in a given case, um, the impact on employees rather than merely the legal entity of the respondent. So it was considered that, that the risk of that mitigation was a factor. Um, and even if the respondent did succeed in uh, obtaining vacant possession, uh, even if it were to succeed, then it was held that there would be some reputational damage um, in terms of how the respondent is regarded uh, by the public and also difficulties in its relationship with the developer and with its students and prospective students. So uh, the, the uncertainty around the development project proceeding and the impact of that on uh, the university, I think it's probably fair to say, uh, summarises um, what was dealt with, uh, at least in paragraph 56. And then at 57, the tribunal go on and they say there's a further risk and they say, albeit a lower risk, that the respondent will be unsuccessful in that litigation and will be unable to meet its obligations to the developer. Um, so, of course, that, that brings into play the possibility of it being in breach of contract with the developer and, of course, damages claims. But in respect of this, this first condition, whether it's compensatable by money, um, the submission by the university that potential injunctive proceedings might then be brought against the university was a factor that uh, the tribunal felt uh, again um, enabled the respondent to succeed on this question. Um, again, stress was mentioned, the damage to the relationship, the developer, reputational damage, and all of that was held not to be compensatable um, by money. And was that a surprising approach given what's been said previously um, in other cases about um, injury and compensation of that injury? So in the, in the first Islington decision, uh, which was um, a decision at the, at the interim stage, uh, the, really it was, it was one of the very first decisions on the code. So I think the Deputy President was trying to give some, some guidance about what some of these provisions might mean. Uh, and so in relation to the sorts of prejudice that, that might not be compensatable by money, um, he, he said that it, it may be better, this is at 34 of the judgment, it may be better not to speculate on what type of prejudice would be incapable of adequate compensation by money and to leave it to individual cases to provide examples. But uh, there may be cases in which aesthetic or personal considerations meant that compensation uh, for any diminution in financial value did not provide adequate recompense. So uh, he was 
dangling, I think, in front of the landowner community, that aesthetic considerations may be that sort of intangible um, quality that one can't compensate with money. One might think that that, that might be a relatively rare consideration in terms of tipping the balance, uh, particularly in terms of your average tower block or your average field. Um, but then this this second limb, personal considerations, I think that's quite, it certainly seemed to me at the time to be quite Delphic. It wasn't clear what personal considerations might count. And so I think um, the landowner community at the time was skeptical that the tribunal would view these sorts of factors uh, in a generous way. I think it was felt that that uh, this first condition would be drawn fairly tightly and really very few things would prevent an agreement from being imposed. So uh, it, it could be said that some were some from the landowner side of the fence were pleasantly surprised by this decision being the, the very first that considered the question, uh, does the prejudice out, uh, outweigh the benefit? Um, that was determined in favour of the landowner and that these intangible points weren't just dismissed as sort of um, paranoia or, 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 or undue concern, but were considered enough of a point, not just to outweigh benefit, but to, to stop the case before there and, and allow the landowner to succeed on, on the first condition also. Okay, thanks, John. And then moving to that second condition um, in paragraph 21, so the balance between public benefit against prejudice. Um, what did the judge in this case say about assessing public benefit? Okay, so, so two of my submissions were roundly rejected. Firstly, the idea that one looks at, at, at what, what public benefit or disbenefit might exist in a world where the order isn't granted. And um, one of the submissions was, well, it, uh, there may well be, be significant public disbenefit caused by the granting of the order if it turns out that that then delays the development, which was a very sizable development with lots of affordable housing and lots of other amenities. But the tribunal said, no, 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 that's not something that we really need to consider. We need to consider the public benefit of the order and not start casting around for disbenefits uh, elsewhere in a sort of non-telecom sense. And um, secondly, they rejected the idea that, that um, they should consider other types of order that the claimant could have applied for. So the university was, was always clear that it was content for a longish term interim agreement to be agreed. So five years or thereabouts, um, hence the decision to which Toby referred earlier that um, the, the jurisdiction of the tribunal was held to be sufficient to grant that sort of order, but it simply wasn't applied for. It wasn't within the gift of the tribunal to grant that. And so they held that considering um, the alternative theoretical possibility of a five-year interim agreement was akin to considering an alternative site. It wasn't, it wasn't something they had to consider. All they had to consider was the order that was sought and either it met the first condition and the second or it did not. So those are the, really the two preliminary points. And then as regards the actual balance that one has to conduct at, at, at paragraph 21.3, Judge Cook said that it was difficult because public benefit and, and private prejudice are not commensurable. So we're, we're here trying to, to guess how the tribunal will compare apples and oranges. And it's not necessarily clear, particularly before one's had a case on it, whether the tribunal prefers apples or oranges. Um, but nonetheless, uh, clearly the tribunal had to do its best to compare those two sort of non-commensurable elements. Um, and although the landowner was successful, there is a very clear and very strong note of caution at paragraph 51 of the, of the judgment, saying that the level of prejudice must be very high indeed to outweigh the public benefit in the light of the public demand for and dependence upon the availability of electronic communications. The benefit is perhaps even higher today than, uh, than it was when the code was enacted. And so, of course, clearly everybody knows, given that we're 400 odd people tuned in via Zoom, um, clearly we're, we are to a much greater extent at the moment reliant on such communications. Um, but the fact that the tribunal went as far as to say that it must be very high indeed, despite finding for the landowner in this case, I think gives a very clear steer that the landowner community should not be jumping up and down expecting, you know, in, enjoy expecting to win every case. I think um, one must look very, very carefully to see if one can identify specific prejudice 
rather than just saying, oh, I don't really want the operator on my roof and it would be terribly inconvenient. Um, the, the starting point, I think, must be that uh, public benefit will generally outweigh inconvenience and annoyance and that sort of um, that sort of gripe that most landowners would, would justifiably feel. So if your submissions on public benefit were rejected, John, um, why did you why did you win on that condition? So the, the, the test was, was effectively held to be a very simple one, that one compares the public benefit that will result from the order with the prejudice that will result from the order. And um, the, the risk of the, the punitive £3 million rent that, to which Toby referred earlier was, was a big factor um, in considering the first condition. As I've already mentioned, the tribunal was assessing this factor of risk and it, it certainly didn't feel the need to conclude that something would happen on the balance of probabilities in order to give it weight. So the very, the very nature of risk, particularly when one's talking about a development context, the nature of risk is, is to cause very serious headaches to, to all parties really in, in development. When one has uncertainty that one can't control, that is a bad thing. Um, and here one had uncertainty as to whether one had to pay three million pounds a year and that really uh, was considered to be a substantial factor. Um, and also, secondly, the possibility of being liable in very substantial damages if um, vacant possession was not given up as it was required to be under the development agreement. Um, then there was a possibility of or a risk of the university facing uh, a, a substantial damages claim. Um, and although uh, the obvious answer from an operator's point of view is, well, you only assess prejudice in the context of the fact that it's compensatable. And surely if there is such a problem, uh, it could be compensated uh, in the usual way under the code. But to that, the tribunal said, well, although a damages claim may be theoretically recoverable, uh, quote, the process of doing so is hardly likely to be easy, unquote. So again, it's this idea of uncertainty. You, you may get your your, your bird in hand, but um, at the moment it's two in the bush, you know, it's, there is no certainty and that itself is prejudice. Thanks John. Before we turn to the um, the issue of terms, I just want to feed in one of the questions we've got, um, which relates to what you said. Somebody's asked if the prospective, if the site provider had been, for example, an investment fund rather than a university, then do you think the case would have been decided differently? I guess that goes to, you know, if the question is the personal circumstances, um, obviously all the facts are relevant. So would you say that the outcome may have been different? Well, it's, it's always going to depend upon what, what uh, items of prejudice one is asserting. So one of the, one of the factors that was put in the mix and was was considered to be valid was the relationship and the, the uncertainty and the consequences for the relationship between the university and its students and so a factor like that would be unlikely to apply in the case of a let's say a more faceless entity that happens to be owning the building and notionally occupying it but not in the same way as a university um, but nonetheless it, it seems to me that at least in relation to the second question if any entity has got um, the risk of very substantial rent and the risk of a very substantial damages claim against it, uh, where the recompense in respect of that damages claim against the operator further down the line is to some extent uncertain. It seems to me that in relation to those points, it, it probably doesn't matter that it's a, 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 a large corporation investment vehicle or insurance fund or whatever, uh, as distinct from university. Uh, however, you can certainly imagine situations in which um, um, the nature of the occupier and its relationship with its customers, suppliers, traders um, may be relevant. Uh, but, but what I would say is that uh, my, my attempt to bring into the equation uh, these beneficial elements of the development, such as lots of new houses, including lots of affordable houses, by saying, well, this is jeopardized and hence there's disbenefit to the order. That was, that was sidelined. So um, the fact that, that, that uh, some good will come about, or maybe one has uh, an entity that, that might be considered to be more sympathetic than a, perhaps a more faceless vehicle, um, that is only really a very limited relevance. And it's only of relevance if 
it goes to the question of how much prejudice that entity suffers. Okay, thanks, John. So then moving to the issue of terms, it's obviously important to make clear that this part of the judgment is obiter. Um, what, before this judgment, what has the tribunal said generally about um, their discretion uh, when it comes to the terms of an agreement, if one is to be imposed? So the first point perhaps is to make uh, a point about 23.5. So perhaps if we could have the second slide back, which I think had paragraph 23.5 on it. Um, there we are, yes. So um, the terms of the agreement must include the terms the court thinks appropriate for ensuring that the least possible loss and damage is caused by the exercise of the code right to the persons who, and including the occupier and people who had interest in the land. Um, so that's, that's a provision that has been the subject of a number of comments. I think it's fair to say that there is not total clarity in everyone's mind as to the approach that the tribunal will take to this provision. Um, I, I certainly confess to finding it difficult, particularly uh, in the context of a, of, a, of a legislative scheme where one has compensation provisions. Um, the approach one takes to loss and damage is, I think, is difficult. Um, but as regards terms in general, um, the first point I'd, I'd, I'd make is um, a case from uh, from a case called Keist, um, in which it, it was said that although code rights are a closed and defined list, they're at uh, paragraph three of the code, um, there's seemingly no conceptual limit on what um, what right can be granted as a quote term, as a term of the agreement. Um, so if it's not a code right, nonetheless, um, if the tribunal considers it appropriate, anything goes as to terms. There's no jurisdictional bar on a right being granted as a term. Secondly, in, in a case called London and Quadrant, uh, the deputy president uh, emphasized that the tribunal really does have a very wide discretion. Um, but he said that that would be exercised with the statutory purpose well in mind. Um, and really here, he has an eye on the government strategy to help operators extend their networks. That's one of the significant uh, guiding uh, imperatives behind the code. Make sharing easier and make uh, infrastructure deployment and, and maintenance cheaper. Um, and that, of course, feeds into the valuation provisions in the code. Um, thirdly, in key stand in London Quadrant, um, the, the fact that agreements are not being imposed for open market consideration is a, a relevant uh, point. Uh, fourthly, I'll say that um, the question of, of whether there's a presumption in favour of the operator's terms that the operator proposes is a, is a difficult one. Um, the operator has to put forward terms. Um, it has to serve a notice saying, this is the agreement that I want, these are the terms that I want. And those, of course, then form the basis of their claim in the event that the matter proceeds to the tribunal. Um, so there is already a menu of terms that is asked for. Um, uh, but the Deputy President says in, in London Quadrant that there's no presumption in favour of the operator's terms. Um, and there's certainly no onus on the landowner to justify a departure from them. But he, he does go on to say that from a practical point of view, the operator's standard terms are, are likely to provide a template for negotiation and the tribunal will usually be concerned only with those terms which the parties cannot agree. So in some senses, it's a sort of de facto starting point. Although the expression starting point itself, I think, is, a, is quite a difficult idea when one has considerations like whose burden of proof is it and to what standard. Um, and then uh, on at least one point um, in London and Quadrant being the definition of equipment, and the tribunal resolved the issue uh, on the basis of the understandable desire on the part of the operators for uniformity in its agreement. So that there might be as a sort of tiebreaker, there may be a, um, a leaning towards uniformity. And certainly one can see why operators want uh, a uniformity in terms. It makes their lives a lot easier. It makes their lives easier to have the terms they want, but it also makes their life easier for those terms to be uniform across their network. Uh, and then finally, fifth, I'd, I'd say that from the OAL case itself, um, Judge Cook placed very significant emphasis on the giving of quotes, due respect to the professionalism of both parties, which I think is, is a, a polite way of saying that parties shouldn't be too suspicious of each other uh, and site providers shouldn't 
seek to insist on terms that micromanage the way that operators use land. Um, I think the tribunal certainly has, has indicated on a number of occasions that it, it wishes this litigation to be less combative. Uh, whether or not that's a vain hope remains to be seen, but certainly there is limited interest on the part of the tribunal in um, seeking to micromanage to the nth degree what operators do on the land. And one of the reasons to justify that sort of approach is that there are typically numerous provisions in the agreement of a general nature which require the operator to cause as little nuisance as possible, as little loss and damage as possible, those sorts of catch-all provisions. Okay, and then turning specifically to compensation, in the UAL decision, what does Judge Cook say about um, compensation and specifically contractual mechanisms for determining compensation for future injury? There are, of course, provisions in the code for the assessment of compensation, uh, paragraph 25 being the obvious one, and that refers to 84, which is which is applied. Um, and what was said in UAL in particular was that terms that provide a separate mechanism for the determination and payment of costs incurred by the site provider are, quotes contrary to paragraph 86 of the code. So that certainly, at least in UAL, those sorts of clauses um, were not favoured. Thanks, John. Um, Toby, you've been quiet for a long time. Um, can I ask you what you consider to be the wider significance um, of that point about contractual mechanisms? Uh, well, there's quite an important practice point here for people who are trying to negotiate agreements with code, it seems to me. Um, as John says, there's a provision in the code for compensation. And that provision, paragraph 25, makes it clear that you can come back for further compensation from the tribunal. So if uh, you enter into a code agreement and then it subsequently transpires that further damage is caused to you by the existence, the exercise of these codes rights, which the, tri which the code operator has, but doesn't necessarily have to exercise immediately. Uh, and if it's got a wide spectrum of it, it may want to exercise more of them later than which it weren't envisaged at the beginning, then you can come back to the tribunal and get, uh, have another go. What um, uh, Judge Cook has ruled out is the possibility of including a provision in the agreement, uh, or at least for the tribunal to impose a uh, term in the agreement, which allows uh, the parties effectively to arbitrate what the what the compensation should be or something like that. So, but you have to bear in mind that the right to go back for compensation is only in relation to uh, agreements which are imposed by the tribunal. So it doesn't apply automatically to any code agreement. So if you enter into an agreement with a code operator, which doesn't provide for that, the compensation that you've agreed in the agreement is the compensation and that's it. So you have this strange situation that in relation to an agreement which you might want to agree, you will want to try and persuade the code operator to include in a, a provision in that saying, if further prejudice is in cause, you can come back for more compensation. Uh, or that you have a mechanism in it which says the compensation will be worked out in a particular way. And if they won't agree that, you may have to dig in and wait for them to go to the tribunal to impose an agreement. But in fact, the, the tribunal, when you get to the tribunal, won't be able to do anything other than say, we'll assess compensation now on the basis of the prejudice that we can see now. Uh, and then you'll have to come back to us. So don't uh, the, pre the practice point is don't agree one of these things, assuming that if further prejudice is caused to you later on, for example, because your agricultural field suddenly becomes within a development plan or something like that, uh, and then you're prevented for another five years or six years from building it out. Don't think that you can come back to the tribunal for more money in relation to that uh, if you haven't put it into your agreement itself. Thanks, Toby. Um, I'm moving on to another aspect of the terms of the agreement. This issue has had quite a bit of recent attention. Um, in some of the previous cases and now um, in on tower um, and this is the issue of upgrading and sharing um, so John if you could just remind us what the tribunal has had to say about that issue yes yeah, so uh, upgrading and sharing are two very important issues um, they were issues that in, in UAL received a lot of the attention um, in submissions as, as can be seen from the judgment, there, are, there were a lot of 
different points that needed to be determined in relation to terms. And of course, now that we have that judgment, one would hope that in future cases, there will be fewer uh, arguments, or at least in, in each individual case, there'll be fewer terms about which arguments are being had. Um, but out of all those, those terms, upgrading and sharing were really the ones that, that received the most attention. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it is generally considered that the right to upgrade and the right to share are important. And, and Judge Cook said they were immensely important um, in her judgment. Um, the Law Commission um, report considered um, both of these rights. And it's clear from that document and it's clear from all of the judgments really that, that these rights are very important to the purpose for which the code was enacted. Um, paragraph 17 of the code deals with upgrading and sharing. Uh, so perhaps if I could ask for that slide to be to be put up. That's the next slide, so it's slide three, I think the third and final slide. So this paragraph uh, is within part three of the code, um, which is entitled Assignment of Code Rights and Upgrading and Sharing of Apparatus. So it comes before part four. Part four is the part of the code that deals with the imposition of agreements. So um, when one looks at 17.1, an operator, the main operator who has entered into an agreement under part two of this code may, if the conditions in subparagraphs two and three are met, A, upgrade, B, share the use of such electronic communications apparatus with other operators. Um, so it's, it's any operator that's entered into an agreement under part two. So it's not just dealing with a situation where an agreement is imposed. It's also dealing with a consensual situation. Um, and the two conditions are at 17.2 and 17.3. Um, the first condition is that any changes as a result of the upgrading or sharing to the electronic communications apparatus to which the agreement relates have no adverse impact or no more than a minimal adverse impact upon its appearance. And then three, the second condition is that the upgrading or sharing imposes no additional burden on the other party to the agreement. What does additional burden mean? Well, 17.4 tells us it includes anything that either A, has an additional adverse effect on the other party's enjoyment of the land, or B, causes additional loss, damage, or expense to that party. Now, I'll just pause there to note that 23.5, which deals with the, the imposition of terms of all sorts, um, does contain uh, a mandate to seek to diminish uh, loss and damage. So um, the, the safeguards in 17, if you like, the, the fact that upgrading and sharing can occur subject to not causing any uh, additional loss, damage or expense to the landowner seems to me to tie in to some extent with the language used of 23.5 which also aims to um, reduce and diminish uh, loss and damage. Um, uh, 17.5 effectively prevents one from contracting out of, of this, uh, this paragraph, by which I mean one cannot rob the operator of this right if they are going to comply with the first condition and the second condition, 17.2, 17.3, they have the right to share they have the right to upgrade. You can't remove that from them uh, in any agreement under part two, whether it's purportedly consensual or though it's imposed. Um, so this is what's been called the irreducible minimum by the tribunal. Um, it, it is something that the tribunal uh, um, doesn't need to mention. If it doesn't mention it in the agreement, um, these are the provisions that, um, th that allow uh, an operator to share or to upgrade, but query can the tribunal uh, offer rights which are broader than this. Can the tribunal say, well, you can upgrade, you can share, even if you do contravene the first condition, contravene the second condition. And um, the assumption so far on the part of the tribunal has been that yes, this is just a minimum um, and more liberal rights can be granted. Unlimited full rights to share and to upgrade uh, can be granted uh, in an appropriate case. And so the controversy that then arises is, well, when, and how does that square with what must surely, some would argue, have been the policy behind paragraph 17? 
Well, it, it, it is said in UAL at, at paragraph 188 that if the operator wants more than paragraph 17 gives, um, it must justify it. Um, and in London and Quadrant, um, where it, it definitely wasn't obita, uh, at paragraph 78, it is confirmed that it's for the operator to justify anything that goes beyond paragraph 17. If they want to contravene first and second conditions, they've got to justify it. Um, now, clearly any decision is going to depend upon the facts of each case. Um, and in UAL at, at 190, Judge Cook said, if the claimant can show that in this particular case, there's little or no reason why the safeguards, i.e. the first and second condition, should be included, that may be a reason to exclude them, um, which, um, well, it's, it, it certainly is a, a confirmation that in her view, there is jurisdiction to go beyond 17. And if it doesn't really play a part on the facts of the case, if, if 17 isn't really of any assistance, then, well, it might be considered appropriate to depart from them. And in UAL, um, the conclusion was effectively six of one half dozen of the other. The aesthetic safeguard at the first condition was considered to be of little benefit because the building was coming down anyway. Um, so even if there was any kind of aesthetic argument, it wasn't going to be a, a very long standing. And in, in, in any event, no one was arguing any kind of aesthetic case at all. Um, but in relation to the 17.3 safeguard, the second condition, it was considered that, um, that, that that would be a potential benefit to the university. And so that one was included. Um, now, in, in London and Quadrant, uh, this, this minimum that paragraph 17 gives was held um, to be perhaps not appropriate for an agreement between an infrastructure provider and a site provider for a long term of, of for example, 10 years. Um, the fact that CTIL in that case provided infrastructure to others and the fact that there's a long term were both relevant to the question of um, whether they should be allowed to share. Uh, on a basis that was more liberal than that granted by paragraph 17. Um, but then I note that in the Scottish case of Fotheringham, um, the, the point was made there in the judgment that, that there are no special provisions for infrastructure providers. Um, and so query how one deals with that sort of business as distinct from, let's say, E or an operator of that nature. Um, and I think that sort, of, that sort of debate is still in its infancy. Um, the Deputy President went on to hold in London Quadrant that uh, unrestricted upgrading was, was important, that not imposing, um, or not imposing that sort of right would diminish the public benefit uh, and that that's the object of the agreement. So um, given the importance of upgrading, uh, the, the restrictions of paragraph 17 were not applied. Um, now, uh, so in, th in that case also sharing was sharing was allowed with two operators because the evidence was that that would be the likely outcome of what was what was needed by the the claimant um now uh, just two observations in general as regards upgrading and sharing it's clear that there's a policy decision that this is important um and uh, at, at present um the tribunal seems to be giving significant weight to that policy decision um, and not considering it to be tempered by the fact that a balance was struck seemingly in paragraph 17 in the first place. Uh, in Fotheringham, by contrast, um, the, the, the tribunal in Scotland held that it would require, quotes, pretty compelling evidence to justify terms which could result in, in, uh, in a more liberal sharing and upgrading than paragraph 17 allows. Um, and the, the very reason why that was said to be so was that Parliament had already struck this balance between operators and, uh, and, and landowners um, in enacting paragraph 17. And so that was that was the starting point in more than just a chronological sense. It was something in order to displace it, one needs, um, quotes, pretty compelling evidence. Now, um, it's important to consider briefly the, the very recent case of On Tower, which was handed down very recently in, in December. Um, and that uh, was, again, a decision of, of Judge Cook, um, just a few months after UAL, of course. And the context is slightly different. It's a, it's a part five application to terminate an existing agreement and impose a fresh one. So it's not a case where the operator is going on for the first time. Um, 
but nonetheless, it's a case where terms were an issue because it was it was accepted um, by both parties that a sharing and upgrading right would go in the agreement. It's just a question of how liberal that would be with the landowner saying, well, paragraph 17 uh, contains these conditions, they're safeguards, they should apply, and the operator saying no, no, no. And Judge Cook expressly disagreed with the following approach, um, the, the pretty compelling evidence point, saying that, um, well, she respectfully disagreed, she said evidence, yes, but there is no hint in the Law Commission's report or in government policy or the code itself that rights to share or to upgrade beyond those contained in paragraph 17 might be unusual or generally unnecessary. Quite the contrary, although as the tribunal said in uh, UAL, paragraph 194, the imposition of paragraph 17 conditions is a useful starting point. Um, now, it, it may well be it may well be that others don't see this distinction, but the distinction I immediately noticed there is that in, in UAL, Judge Cook said that paragraph 17 was the starting point, whereas in uh, On Tower, she says that 17 is a useful starting point. Um, and it seems to me that the degree of evidence required to depart from that starting point in On Tower was certainly different than that which was required in Fotheringham, would have been required in Fotheringham. Um, and so there is a tension, at least there, I think, between those two decisions. Um, and we'll just have to see uh, how that's resolved in due course as to the proper approach um, to paragraph 17 and how it impacts um, what, what rights are granted as regards sharing and as regards uh, upgrading. Um, in, in the Ontow case, uh, there was also a, a, a distinction in the way that the tribunal dealt with sharing compared with upgrading. And this was on the basis that upgrading is a code right under paragraph 3, it's 3C, it's within 3C, whereas sharing is not expressly a code right. Um, and so Judge Cook held in, in Ontower that the paragraph 21 test that we saw earlier with the um, the two conditions, namely whether whether the prejudice is compensatable by money, uh, and secondly whether it outweighs the public benefit, um, she held that those tests were relevant, and she went on to apply those tests in relation to upgrading, but not seemingly in relation to sharing, um, and that also is an interesting point. It's one that will doubtless be of application or of interest in in part five cases. And of course, naturally, now we're getting more and more part five cases um, because of the, the amount of time that the um, legislation has been around for. There are more agreements that are coming to an end and that need to be or are perceived to need to be updated um, and brought into the, the brave new world with the terms that operators would prefer rather than the old terms that previously existed. Um, now, one can go away and look at what happens under a Part 5 application, um, paragraph 3411 of the code applies a number of the provisions that apply to a para 20 application under part 4, um, but certainly to my mind it doesn't expressly apply paragraph 21, so it's interesting um, to see the tribunal apply paragraph 21, it'd be interesting to see what approach um, they take in the future. Um, as regards this question of, of what the starting point should be, um, I, I, I note that as a generality, um, one sees from the case of Ashlock, um, which I, I pause to note will be in the Court of Appeal fairly shortly, um, one sees from that case that um, under, a, under a paragraph 34, under a part five case, um, the terms of the existing agreement, i.e. the one that's being terminated, that is the starting point, it's being held to be the starting point, just as the case of OMA says the existing um, terms of the existing tenancy uh, are the starting point for 1954 Act cases. Um, however, of course, when one has expressed statutory provisions such as paragraph 17, in the context of upgrading and sharing, it could be argued that actually the starting point or another starting point is paragraph 17, which of course is what was said in UAL and has been said in other cases. So one has perhaps a tension there as to whether one can start from two different places. Um, and the weight that should be given either to the existing terms or to paragraph 17. And these are all questions that doubtless will be right for determination in the near future. 
Thanks, John. Um, we've got about four minutes um, for all the questions um, that have appeared in the Q&A. Um, so I think if I just will deal with as many as, as, many as we can. Um, firstly, just directed to you, Toby, um, someone who's raised a question about um, costs. Is the tribunal likely to treat a landowner who unsuccessfully seeks to defend their property interests from compulsory imposition of rights in the same way as any other unsuccessful litigant vis-a-vis -vis costs? Uh, well, the short answer so far is yes. The, um, uh, there was an early attempt, I think, I think by John, <laughs> a non-successful attempt. That's not a theme, by the way. John has been tried lots of ways um, to say that in that situation, if you're reasonably objecting to rights in the same way as uh, if you object under Section 84 of the Royal Property Act to the removal of a restrictive covenant, if your objection is um, reasonable, then if you lose anyway, it's a sort of no-cost jurisdiction. If you're unreasonable, then you might be subject to some costs. There's absolutely no indication, um, and the, the statute revision seems to suggest otherwise, uh, in, in relation to uh, the code. It's a cost jurisdiction, um, the loser pays. And there is a consequence for site um, owners in relation to that, because of course, it's a slightly asymmetric warfare in relation to this. You're not gonna get very much money for this thing. Uh, and the tribunal, you are gonna be arguing about terms. The tribunal have flagged the fact that they think it's a reasonable argument to say that these are standard terms and we like to have lots of terms across our estate that are the same. So you 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 take on quite a battle and quite a risk in relation to these battles um, by by uh, opposing the imposition of these agreements, which are quite draconian in their nature, in, in my view. So uh, yeah, I'm afraid the short answer is if you lose, you pay the cost. I should say that there is a sort of one uh, crumb of comfort in the fact that. Uh, the tribunal always raise their eyes at the level of costs which get incurred in relation to these things and then start preventing people from recovering their costs uh, at the level which they've been incurred. There have been a couple of decisions uh, which have said uh, the costs are, are out of all proportion to the dispute. But the reality is litigation is expensive and the tribunal can't just wish that away. So if you do want to fight about this, there is a big uh, chunk of your own costs and potentially a chunk of risk of the other side's costs. Yeah. John, just a sort of practical question um, to you from the outcome of the UAL case. Um, somebody's asked about whether, um, given that the CTIL were not asking for interim rights, which went beyond the, the proceedings, does that mean that CTIL has now removed their apparatus? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure they were installed in they? The, the, the interim rights were put onto your building, John? Yes, Did so they, the... Not the factual context was that the um, the apparatus had been on on the previous building, the shopping centre, um, and and what they were seeking to do was to go on to a replacement building for that. Um, so, uh, query what the exact situation is on the ground, but the the kit didn't go on to the onto the university building. Right, I think we're going to have to um, wrap up now because it's noon. Um, sorry that we didn't get to all of your questions, but thanks very much to everyone for um, joining us. Um, as I said, the recording will be sent to you um, in due course so that you'll have an opportunity to watch the whole thing or select parts. Um, so thanks very much.